Hey, it's Huck. And like many of you, I find myself having been glued to the television set these last two weeks, taking in all the Olympic coverage. I guess I've been doing that since I was 12 years old, ever since the Mexico City Summer Olympics in 1968. That Olympics is probably best remembered for Bob Beeman's unbelievable long jump leap of 29 feet two and a half inches, which broke the existing world record by almost two feet, 55 centimeters, for those of you who use the metric system. The fact is, that jump was so incredibly beyond everyone's expectations that the optical sensors surrounding the landing pit where Beeman landed with his jump weren't even able to detect a jump that long. The officials had to measure it by hand. Beeman himself was so stunned upon learning the news of his accomplishment that he literally went into shock. He actually had to be helped to his feet and back to his coaches by his competitors. Now, there can be no doubt that Beeman was helped along that day by the fact that the site of those Olympic Games was in Mexico City, where the altitude is a little over a mile high. And, well, it obviously gave Beeman an advantage in attempting to break that world record. However, it's now been 44 years later, and in the thousands and thousands of events held worldwide since that time, that leap of 29 feet two and a half inches remains the Olympic record and the second farthest wind legal jump of all time. Now as the 2012 Summer Olympics in London wind to a close, I'm reminded of Bob Beeman's unbelievable record-setting jump, along with other stunning, memorable, and well, even sometimes tragic events that all make up what is the legacy of the Olympics. And so, in a departure from my usual comedy and music videos I tend to feature on this channel, I thought it only fitting that today I ought to pay tribute to the remarkable athletes around the world who have helped make the Olympics what it is. And I want to do that by talking about two athletes who I believe illustrate what the Olympics are really all about. Now the names of these two athletes may be familiar to you, maybe not. But one thing that distinguishes both of them is that neither ever won a gold medal at the Olympics. It was the pursuit of that dream that defines for me what the Olympic spirit and, in the end, what the human spirit is all about. Glenn Cunningham was seven years old when he, along with three of his older siblings, left their farmhouse one winter morning and walked a approximately two miles to the one-room schoolhouse where they all attended classes. Like most mornings, the Cunningham kids were the first to arrive. Glenn's brother Floyd, 14 years old, started placing wood inside the pot-bellied stove inside the schoolroom that morning to try to warm the classroom up before the teacher and the other 12 students arrived for class that morning. As he fetched the five gallon can of what he thought was kerosene, he had no way of knowing that the night before there had been a town meeting inside the schoolroom where one gentleman had left a five gallon can of gasoline to help light everyone's lanterns for their walk home after the meeting. Well, Floyd 
after piling wood inside the stove, started dousing the wood with what he thought was kerosene and inevitably resulted in a rather huge explosion. Glenn's brother Floyd died just nine days later, but Glenn, who was standing right next to his brother when they were engulfed in flames, didn't come out of it much better. He lost six toes and most of his traverse arch on one foot, while basically all of the skin on both legs from the knees all the way down to the ankles were completely gone. A doctor who had rushed to the home from as far away as Elkhart, Kansas, told Glenn's mother that, well, even if he could somehow recover from these injuries, he'd never walk again. But the fact is, the infections were almost sure to take his life if they didn't amputate both legs right away. Overhearing this conversation between the doctor and his mother, when Glenn's mom came back into the room, Glenn told his mom, I don't want to be an invalid. I will walk. I will walk. And burst into tears. Well, Glenn's mom relented and never forced her son to have that surgery. Instead, day after day without fail, for 22 months, Glenn's mom applied compresses and dressings to the rotting flesh on Glenn's legs, fighting the repeat occurrences of infections that just never seemed to go away, and took time every day to spend hours massaging and nurturing the muscles and tendons in both of his two legs. It took nearly two years, but indeed Glenn did walk again, never without pain, and always a little lopsided. The pain, he said, felt like daggers. He took to walking around the farm, holding on to the tail of some of the farm animals, helping to take some of the weight off as he moved along with the animals. And then one day, he made a discovery. It hurt a little less if he ran rather than walked. And so, he ran. He ran everywhere. Everywhere he had to go, he went there running. At the age of 12, Glenn entered into a race at his school, mostly involving older high school boys. Well, not only did he win that race, but he won it hands down. And this changed everything. While the pain never seemed to go away, Glenn was determined to keep running. Glenn went on to set all-time high school, college, and world record times in both the mile and the 1500 meter run. Before and after each and every race, Glenn would take nearly an hour to rigorously massage both of his scarred legs. And the pain, well, that was something he had just learned to endure. In the 1932 Olympics, in the 1500 meter run, Glenn ended up finishing just out of the medals in fourth place. This might have been because he entered the race with a fever suffering from tonsillitis. The winner of that race was someone he had already defeated at least three times. In the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, Germany, Glenn would beat the world record in the 1500 meter race by four tenths of a second. But as fate would have it, it was not enough. New Zealand runner Jack Lovelock established a new world mark in the 1500 meter race that day, edging Glenn by six tenths of a second. Glenn would go on to set many more world records, including his best time ever in the mile of four minutes, four seconds, and four tenths, a record that stood for 17 years. But 
When the 1940 Summer Olympics was canceled due to World War breaking out, Cunningham retired once and for all. And he and his wife devoted most of the rest of their lives to working with poor and troubled youth at the Cunningham Youth Ranches, established both in his home state of Kansas and in the state of Arkansas. Glenn never won an Olympic gold medal, taking silver in 1936. And he never quite fulfilled his other dream of breaking the four-minute barrier in the mile run. But Glenn said he was never really disappointed by those shortcomings. As he put it, I know I'd done my best.